All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 231 tonight. Uh, this is Mysteries and Metaphysics 4.5. Um, if you've been following the series, Mysteries and Metaphysics is something that we're going through. All the metaphysical, metaphysics, philosophical stuff that we've talked about on the show from episode one to roughly 2.30, uh, which is you know what we're about on right now. Uh, and we look at things how we used to look at them, you know, or the way we used to analyze things versus how we analyze them or look at them now. Uh, just kind of showing the growth of the show and ideas and philosophies and things like that. Uh, so this part of the series, though, that we've been discussing, um, the 4.0s, has been on megalithic structures around the world and different cultures. I think 4.3 we did on like ancient Greek temples and megalithic structures. 4.4 we did on miscellaneous megalithic structures. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this one tonight because ancient Egypt is one of our favorite topics and something we've uh, discussed a lot on the show in the past. Um, but before we get started, um, if anybody hasn't checked out already, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash podcast For just $2 a month, you'll get exclusive guest episodes and segments. Uh, one of our more popular episodes was the last one we did, actually. It was a month and a half ago. We did with uh, Randall Carlson, um, and we did an excellent um, uh, Patreon segment with him as well on cosmic numbers and sacred geometry. And uh, yeah, I, I highly urge everybody to check that out if you have not already, if you listen to our show. And uh, if you're interested in Mind Escape merch, here's some shots of some of the uh, designs I've created. Uh, you can go to our, um, our merch shop. The link is down below. And uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Shirts, cups, mugs, tapestries, all sorts of stuff on there. So go check it out. Um, and Indra's Web. Uh, I got to get back on that train myself, but Indra'sWeb.org is a social media platform we created to connect open minds. It is live if you want to go set up an account. We are still working on getting that in the App Store. Um, and if anybody's interested, nobody entered to win this, but we have uh, larges and mediums left. If anybody wants to enter to win a Mind Escape t-shirt, all you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Take a screenshot of it and send it to mindescapepodcast at gmail.com and that will enter you to win. Again, nobody even claimed that. So if you do it, you have a good chance of winning this. And I'll pick a winner. Let's see. Maybe I'll pick the end, uh, winner at the end of March here. So submit those. And uh, like I said, it's been a while. It's about a, This is the longest break we've taken. I think it's been about a month and a half. Um, I've had some personal stuff, some mental health and physical health stuff to work out, which I finally got under control. But, uh, you know, we're living in some tough times here. So if anybody has any issues, I urge everybody to reach out and get some help because, you know, can't be too proud. Um, I tried to do it alone for a long time and just came to the realization that nobody can do it all alone. So you got to figure your stuff out. So um, and, uh, oh, one more big thing. This was another reason why we had a long break was I migrated everything over from SoundCloud and our new host is Anchor. So you can check out our Anchor page. We are still on Apple, Spotify, all those. And the deal eventually is I would like to have our podcast, not just on YouTube, but also on Spotify for video as well. Uh, we're not doing that yet, but sometime in the near future. So that's kind of what we're doing. So again, if you're interested, Go check out our anchor page, and uh, <clears throat> we are now, again, we are no longer, I'll leave this stuff up on SoundCloud for a little bit, but again, our main host is now Anchor, so. What's going on, Maurice? Yo, yo, what's the good word? <laughs> uh, nothing, just trying to get back, <laughs> just trying to get back um, in the swing of things here. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, it's been a while that the last episode we did was excellent with Randall Carlson. That was a very fun conversation and uh he's just such a wealth of knowledge on these topics and uh yeah, we got a great response and thank you to everybody that sent nice messages and comments and stuff like that and shout out to all the friends of the show. Uh we're looking forward to getting back into the swing of things here and uh if anybody has any 
guest recommendations. I'm going to start booking a, a bunch of guests here for the next few months. So if you have any recommendations, just shoot us an email to mindescapepodcast at gmail.com. And I'll look at those and see, you know, what we can line up. But, uh, yeah, on with the show. Uh, so tonight we're going to be discussing ancient Egypt, which is a topic that we have touched upon uh, a lot, uh, more so earlier on in the podcast. Um, and I think what drew us in, obviously, our, I've talked about this before, our grandfather had a fast, he was an inventor, but he also had a fascination with ancient Egypt and um, the pyramids. And uh, he even had glass reliefs of um, hieroglyphs of things that, uh, you know, his own translations of things that uh, for people to decode and stuff like that. So there's some history there with our family. Um, and he felt like those were his people. So um, there's something there. But uh, I mean, through doing the show, I, I immediately gravitated towards ancient Egypt. And I think I've slowly kind of veered more I feel like a a little bit more closer to ancient Greece through a lot of the philosophical stuff and uh, cultural stuff there. But I think that's where the roots of some of my heritage uh, comes from as well. But in terms of uh, I always have a soft spot for ancient Egypt just because of the the mystery and the mystique. And, um, you know, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So like what's what truly is a mystery and what could be a mystery and then what's something that's easily debunked? And Maurice is just yeah. icing his way over there with this, <laughs> this clanking of the ice. Well, cheers, my friend. I can't cheers. wait to... I got, a little, uh, I got a little ice, too. I can't wait to get to ancient Egypt. That's actually one of my uh, bucket list places. And maybe we can do an episode on kind of our bucket list locations because... Again, you were mentioning how our grandfather has had had a connection to it, and I don't know if a lot of people have that feeling because I know lots of people are into ancient Egypt because it's one of the world's greatest mysteries, and we know that humans have a a connection to mystery. We we're intrigued by that kind of stuff, so I think that figuring out the pyramids, what were they for, how were they created, I think that's something that lur- lurks inside of all humans. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Um, So tonight, the episode that we're about to do is a slideshow episode. So I'm going to do my best to try and describe and read things that will paint the picture for people that are just listening on the audio platforms. But if you're, you know, not subscribed to our YouTube channel, I I definitely recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel because we do have a lot of slideshow episodes. And uh, obviously, I've been recording our episodes in 4K, too. So the the, it's a little bit crisper than it used to be back in the day. but so in terms of what you're saying, though, uh, with, uh, you know, the mysteries and stuff like that, I think I take the same approach to everything else, which is let's learn everything. Let's learn the alternative myst- mysterious stuff, the mystical stuff. Let's learn the mainstream stuff. And then let's come up with our own ideas and takeaways from things, too. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I used to believe that I no longer believe. There's things that I found out along the way that were in a mystery before, but now it's like the more, you know, uh, the better you can formulate your own philosophies and ideas and theories and hypotheses and all those wonderful things. So, all right, here we go. Before we get going here, I'd like to ask everybody to smash that like button and, uh, subscribe if you haven't. All right. (laughs) <laughs> kind of slip it in there. <clears throat> um, so when people talk about the pyramids, obviously one thing people discuss a lot is, oh, all these pyramids popped up all over the world. You know, were they in co- were these different cultures in contact with each other? And I think the, the more mainstream um, idea or theory behind that is that this is just a way to build up, and that's how humanity... Um, it's just like an evolution of consciousness or thought where everybody kind of came up with similar ideas or around the same time. I don't know how much I put stock into that as much as, you know, people had to have been in somewhat contact with each other or there had to have been some sort of trickle down influence effect from the world. Like maybe this culture touched a little bit of this culture and that culture passed on to this culture kind of a thing. So, um, but with Egypt, you see a progression of building, um, 
from the mastabas, which are these, you know, the graves, the early style of graves. Um, and then you get into, as we can see here, the step pyramid or the pyramid of Zoser, uh, which was built roughly 2670 to 2650 BC. Um, it kind of looks like a ziggurat from like uh, Mesopotamia or, um, uh, you know, the Sumerians and the Akkadians. The, in terms of influence, I don't know how much influence is there, but you can definitely see um, a progression in the pyramid building. Um, now, some people will say, you know, it stopped with the Great Pyramid and that's when everything went downhill from there. Uh, but you definitely see this kind of like work up to it. Um, so, again, here is the Step Pyramid or the Pyramid of Zoser. Uh, okay, so... Here's where you get to Sneferu. Sneferu was the father of Khufu. Khufu is most famous for obviously the building, or most people would give him credit for building the Great Pyramid. Other people would say, no, he might have found it, you know, as the alternative people would, would say. Um, but I'll, I'm just going to read all this stuff off, and then we can kind of come to conclusions later about what actually happened or didn't happen. Um, this is the Pyramid at Maydoom. Uh, the pyramid was built by Old Kingdom Pharaoh, like as I mentioned, Sneferu, in around 2613 B.C. Uh, some people say um, a previous pharaoh started building it and then he took over. There's different kind of, um, uh, there's different theories on what actually happened. But as you can see, it doesn't really look like a pyramid. Like it looks more like a tower, maybe like a medieval tower or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it definitely doesn't have that uh, pyramidal structure as you would expect from like the Giza plateau or uh, the red pyramid or something like that. So, but you do see like the top, it doesn't look like it was finished. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just got kind of like a very rough rustic look to it and it looked like it was definitely abandoned sometime during construction. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing with a lot of these though. It's like, what were they when they started and then who were, did they did a lot of people add to them and right that kind of thing so okay so again here's sneferu sneferu is kind of like the father of pyramids in ancient egypt so you have the previous pyramid supposedly that was like his first or whatever then you get to the bent pyramid um again built by sneferu this is around 2600 bc uh, supposedly the way that the, why the reason why this, they call it the Benton pyramid is you can see it kind of like starts to like cave in a little bit towards the top. And I'm, I'm trying to think what I, I was reading a book. It's supposedly the way it was built. Um, I forget the, the technique used on the inside, but it's kind of like a layering kind of almost like an arching of the, the material towards the top. Um, uh -huh. except the corners were built on not stable, uh, ground or sand and it started to kind of crumble on the edges there on the corners and they used cedar beams uh, on the inside to push the walls um, to keep the walls from crumbling in on the top is, is what I remember I'm pretty sure oh, that's um, interesting so yeah I mean in terms of they call it the bed pyramid because it looks like the top's bent I mean it's it's pretty self-explanatory uh, but again, you see this progression. So you see Maydoom kind of looks really basic and, you know, kind of crappy, let's be honest. And then you see the Ben Pyramid. You start to see a transition towards uh, more of the classic pyramidal structure. Um, that picture's sweet, too, because you can see a person on a camel as a yeah. scale reference. Thank Here's you. another picture of the Bent Pyramid, kind of a different look. You can see a little bit more of the contour uh, there of the top um, and the outside, kind of, you know, the, the um, how it like starts to cave in a little. Uh -huh. um, and again, like even just getting the cedar planks to hold up the inside, and I guess it's super dangerous too. Like people that have been on the inside say it's like pretty, you don't feel safe in there. Sketchy. But, um, but yeah, even to get cedar planks back in the day, the cedar from Lebanon, they would have to trade with Lebanon uh, to get the, you know, there's no trees like that in, in Egypt. So it's kind of a, a big deal uh, to get wood or timber. Okay, so this is how things evolve. So you started with, uh, for Sneferu, you started with um, 
the uh, you know the the pyramid at uh, Maydoom, and then you go to the Bent Pyramid, and now we get to his actual resting place, which is known as the Red Pyramid, and it's called the Red Pyramid because in the sun, as you can see, it gives it kind of like a red tint. Uh, it's in Dashur. Uh, it was the third and final pyramid, began built by Sneferu, and it was built between 2575 and 2551. The Red Pyramid is located approximately one kilometer north of the Bent Pyramid, so it's pretty close. Um, this one, you can kind of see. I mean, it looks like kind of a... Um, uh, it looks similar to the pyramids on the Giza Plateau in terms of, like, the shape, right? Yeah, it looks like it's in pretty good shape, too. Um, so you definitely see a progression um, of building there. I mean, in terms of... Um, this is what I was talking about, though. It's like most people just want to say, oh, this person didn't build these pyramids or that person. But have you really looked into, like, the background? Or have you really looked into... Um, you know, we're all about like fringe and alternative things. And we like different outside the box theories and ideas and things like that. But at the end of the day, have you even really done your research on what the people that have studied this their whole lives have been saying, you know, like, cause why do those people want to be wrong? There's this like idea that there's like these people trying to create these narratives and that might be true for someone that's writing a book or something like that, but there's not this like collective thing happening, trying to prevent, you know, that's just not the case. Um, right. It's just a matter of knowing things or not knowing things. And, um, you know, that's, that's, I like knowing as much as possible, whether it's mainstream alternative, anywhere in between. So, well, we um, know the facts until we don't, that's the way it works. Right. And I mean, look, there's enough mystery in the world. There's enough mystery in these ancient cultures where you don't need to like, um, you know, produce or create more mystery out of nowhere. Absolutely. Here's an aerial view of the Giza Plateau. It's beautiful. Um, you know, you look at how much, uh, how many buildings and structures are around there now, but still, I mean, it's, yeah, kind, that's of, insane. it's kind of like a nice little oasis there. It is cool that they preserved all that, though. Right. So again, I'm just going to lay out all the facts and we can discuss all the, did this person really do it? Dude, you got to quit with the ice, bro. This is super loud. All right. I'm just saying, this this water drinking's getting out of hand and I'm going to call you on it. Um, okay, the pyramids of Giza were built from roughly 2550 to 20 or 2490 BC. The pyramids were built by pharaohs Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare. Uh, the pyramid of, okay, so this is an interesting thing. So you see the, the middle pyramid, the pyramid of Khafre is the second largest of the pyramids of Giza, but it was placed on bedrock, uh, and Khafre took advantage of the surroundings to make it appear larger than the great pyramid of Khufu. So technically it looks bigger than the great pyramid, but it's not, it's just the way that it's propped up on the bedrock. Um, so when people see the pyramids, I think most people think that the pyramid of Khafre, um, is that it's the largest or the great pyramid and it's not so i just wanted to make that clear to everybody because i think that there is mm -hmm. some confusion when i've seen other people talk about it or uh, mention it i don't think they really understand um let's see here all right the great pyramid of giza uh, Pyramid of Khufu, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Pyramid of Cheops, that's another name for Khufu. Uh, it was built around tw uh, roughly 2560 BC. So, again, people want to say oh, it was built way older than that. I don't even have a problem with, like, the dating of things. And we know that there was a recent find uh, last year where I believe a woman archaeologist in Scotland found a piece of wood from the Great Pyramid that they dated dated to roughly even a thousand years earlier um, than the dating of the Great Pyramid. But there's a diff, there's like, you know, when you radiocarbon date stuff, there's error too. So it depends on how you want to look at that, uh, that range. But um, so there's stuff. So like, I'm not hung up on the dating per se, but I mean, just even 2560 BC is so long ago that, that alone um, makes it so impressive that it was, you know, 4,000, 
4,500 years ago um, that these things that were built and uh, you know, people want to make them way older and that's fine. Like I said, I don't have a problem with, you know, whatever speculation or whatever, but at the same time, it's, you can't even fathom how long ago that was really. I mean, most people think like times nothing in that sense, but it's so long ago, like even the ancient Greeks, you know, we're talking about like Socrates and Plato. We're talking 400, 300 BC. That's a long time ago. Now we're talking 2000 years prior to that. That's crazy. That's pretty intense. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, again, we'll get into all that. Okay, so the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the largest and oldest of the three pyramids of Giza. It is the only ancient wonder still standing, and it is the oldest. Uh, the architect was believed to be Hemi Unu, uh, who was also Khufu's vizier. A vizier is like a, uh, like a, I don't even know, like a, a, not an assistant, but like a, like a, you know, like what do you call, uh, I don't even know how to explain but just like somebody's like top person like their top you know if you're the king it's your top second person you know it's your okay. the second in command yeah second or person your confidant or the person that does all your stuff for you or whatever all right. um and actually there's an interesting theory about uh king tut that his vizier is actually the one that like murdered him because they've found some sort of tar on king tut's skull uh, that they think his head was bashed in or something, and there's speculation that maybe his vizier did it and then married his wife, you know, or something like that. I forget. I'd have to go back and read, but I definitely read something Jeez. like that. Um, so, okay, so mainstream archaeologists insist that it was a tomb built by, uh, by and for Khufu of the 4th Dynasty around 2560 B.C., which took 10 to 20 years to build. Now that part of it, I find crazy that it only took 10 to 20 years to build. Um, I don't know why that it just seems like such a short amount of time to build something so enormous back then. I just, I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Well, de determine how many people are working for you. And 20 years is actually a long time. I mean, think about how long 20 years is. It's definitely, you know, uh, a long time, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's again, it, it boils down to how many people are working for you. Right. Uh, which we roughly, just don't know. So. Roughly 2.3 million blocks were quarried from the site at Tura. Uh, Tura has the finest and whitest limestone in Egypt. The quarry was also used for many other structures and temples, including the Bent Pyramid. Uh, the red granite blocks weighing some 80 tons were quarried and transported by boat some 500 miles down the Nile from Aswan to uh, Giza. Uh, and I'll show pictures of Aswan later when we're talking, you know, when we're discussing the obelisk because there's an unfinished obelisk that's famous that's uh, still in Aswan. Uh, but yeah, all the red granite from all these temples and uh, the pyramid and stuff, they all come from Aswan, so... Um, the exterior of the pyramid that was once uh, adorned by white casing stones made from highly polished limestone. Um, most of the casing stones were removed in the 19th century to build a mosque. Uh, one of the mysteries is whether uh, there, wa uh, there was a capstone and what it was made of. Uh, to keep with the current proportions, it would need to be at least 30 feet at the base uh, for the capstone. Uh, some have speculated that the capstone was made out of gold or later stolen um, and later stolen. Uh, however, it would have had to have been too massive um, and high up to steal. I mean, think about how high the, the Great Pyramid is and think of somebody going to the top just to pull down some massive uh, 30 by 30 capstone. I don't know. Just, yeah. That would be heavy and a pain in the butt. You'd need to... It seems unlikely. They would need to, to get it up there. They would obviously need... I mean, there's. we'll get into this, but the theories of how it was built, whether it was an external ramp, an internal ramp, uh, you know, what was the technology that they were using to, to make that happen. Uh, some have uh, speculated the capstone... Or, I already read that. So the accounts from the travelers and historians um, dating all the way back to the time of Christ have noticed the lack of capstone. Um, so again, this is something that's been discussed for a long time. Uh, there are three main chambers. There's the king's and queen's chambers, which are higher up in the interior. 
There was a third uh, chamber that was cut into the bedrock that was never finished. Um, in 1837, British Egyptologist Howard Weiss blew a hole into the stress relieving chamber of King Tut's chamber, or the King, I'm sorry, King, King Tut, of the King's chamber. Uh, he found Khufu's cartouche on the south ceiling of Campbell's chamber. The description read, Companions of Khufu. Uh, there is debate to this day of the validity of the accounts since Vice seemed to uh, not be a virtuous or trustworthy man and took his partner Giovanni uh, Caviglia's speculations about whether or not there was another chamber above Davidson's chamber. Uh, this comes from le letters Caviglia wrote describing his versions of events. Uh, Vice and Caviglia removed, uh, or Vice had Caviglia removed from uh, the Giza complex and uh, took the discovery for himself. Um, Vice found four additional chambers and named them after his colleagues and friends. Others have suggested that Vice, um, running out of time and money, may have fabricated the graffiti and the markings of the cartouche. Uh, another theory is that Khufu may have added his uh, cartouche and graffiti to the pyramid when he became king, claiming it um, for his own, you know, knowing that it was a far older, older structure. That's what some of the alternative people think. Um, uh, this is not unheard of, as many people since ancient times have claimed credit where credit is not due. Okay, uh, the Diary of Mer, uh, which was written roughly 4,500 years ago, uh, it is one of the oldest papyri containing text. It was found in a cave in 2013 by French archaeologists. The text was written with hieroglyphs and heretic. Um, Mayer was a middle-ranking official who detailed his accounts transporting 200 to uh, 200 two to three ton blocks over the period of a month. Uh, he oversaw a few trips every 12 days from Tura to Giza. And uh, he had 400 boatmen working for him. It is unknown whether the projects, uh, whether the projects, the blocks that were being used, um, uh, were being used since Turo was a popular quarry. Like they don't know what the blocks that Mirror was using were for. Uh, it's speculating that they were being used for the pyramid. But uh, this all supposedly happened during 20 or uh, Khufu's 26th year as Pharaoh. Um, here's a picture of Howard Vice. He is. just he looks like a sly devil, doesn't he? Oh yeah. Okay. So now we get to some of the more. These are the mainstream building theories. Um, again, I'm gonna go over everything. I'll lay some of the alternative stuff out too. You know, stuff that we've discussed on the show in the past. The whole point, anybody that hasn't watched our show, we, we like to get everything out there, not just one side or the other, because um, I think it's important that uh, all information gets disseminated so people can make up their own minds on what happened and not necessarily cultivate um, some sort of this or that. Like, we're not just trying to be alternative or just trying to be mainstream. We're just trying to put all the information out there um, is what we're mm -hmm. trying to do, so... Uh, I don't think there's enough of that happening in the world right now. So, um, but, uh, so let's get to it. Um, the Greeks were the first to speculate that slave labor was used to build the Great Pyramid. Um, this is an idea that a lot of the public still believes to this day, including some academics. Um, yeah. Bob, yeah, Bob Breyer, um, in his great courses lecture. Okay. So, if you have Audible, uh, Bob Breyer does uh, the Ancient Egypt Great Courses Lecture. I highly recommend it. Um, it's not really that dogmatic. It just kind of goes through what we know, what we don't know, how we know things. Um, but I, I highly recommend it if you like Ancient Egypt and you're into these subjects. Uh, he talks about how he believes that thousands of skilled tradesmen uh, who could not farm when the Nile would flood during the rainy seasons, they would then go to work on the Great Pyramid. So these were skilled laborers. They weren't anybody that was being forced to do something. These were people, these were tradesmen and tradesmen and farmers and masons that when the Nile would flood, they would go work. Uh, Werner theorized that there were two gangs of 100K men divided into five groups of 20K and maybe broken down even more into smaller groups. Uh, John Romer thought it should have taken 14 years to build. So everybody's got kind of like a little bit of a different spin in terms of like the mainstream. 
uh, Mark Leonard, uh, who I know there's a lot of alternative people that don't, aren't a fan of his, uh, and some other e- Egyptologists conducted a modern uh, construction su- uh, study, which claims 14,000 men on average worked on it, uh, with there being as many as 40K uh, working on it at its peak. The study says that Egyptians used critical path analysis since they did not have wheels, pulleys, or iron tools. Uh, this supposedly took 10 years. So that's another point of argument, too, is people would point to that um, supposedly the only tools that the Egyptians really used for the stuff were copper tools with, like, a slight bit of arsenic in them. Um, uh-huh. And that's how all this stuff, you know, there's different, you know, the when they core things out, there's some people that have online been able to, it takes a long time, but you could drill certain things uh, with sand um, uh, and lubrication, but it takes a long time. And there's other people say that it would take so long that people wouldn't have really used that technique. And there must have been some sort of other ancient technology. I'm not going to get into any of that, the high technology, not high technology, because I just don't really, that's not really interesting to me in terms of like, I don't think that... Um, I've thought a lot about this and I'll I'll get it. I'll save this, the most of this rant for the end, but I'm not so interested in like the exact building techniques of the ancient Egyptian people. I'm more interested in their consciousness and what they knew about like death and philosophy and the mind and things like that, because whether they built something crazy or not, like it doesn't really matter because we can, well, it's built. We know that bad happened. No, I know. No, I know. But that's what I'm saying. But it's just not. It's just the the actual like techniques and things like that. I used to interest me more. Um, I'm currently just more interested in the mind because I think consciousness and the mind is everything. Um, and we'll never know what it was like to be these people during these times in history. But um, I think that. Uh, you know, you look at all the texts and you try and put yourself in there and you look at the language. I think language is huge when you're trying to understand consciousness. And, you know, they're, for, you know, one of the early adopters of written language, obviously hieroglyphs and things like that. So, um, and symbolism and things like that. So when you look at those things, that's what, that's what interests me because it doesn't really matter if they had a special saw or a tool or whatever. Like, how does that help us today? It doesn't necessarily, but what does help us is trying to understand the mindset of these people and, uh, you know, how they were able to accomplish some of these things. So, yeah, I like, I agree with you there, but I also am kind of curious because no, that's what, but that's what I'm saying is what I'm interested in too, but I'm just saying like, there's so many people that get hung up on that aspect of it. That's not, um, if they said, if they came out tomorrow, we said, they said that we found this special technique on this papyrus or this hieroglyph that shows they were able to let's say melt stone or they were able to use this um concoction to you know melt stone like that's cool that's really cool but is that going to change my life in any i mean not really i'm not going to look at them necessarily even really that much differently either i mean do you get what i'm saying or no yeah i get what you're saying but you could apply the same concept of figuring out why life started that we know that we're here so why are we going to look at it you know it's still fun to kind of investigate yeah no it's fun exactly it's fun but i'm saying i'm trying to i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to do but (laughs) uh, ladies and gentlemen no i get what you're saying but at the same time i want to the ramp systems because they said if if they were going to push up these blocks up these ramps the ramps would have been miles and miles long. Well, yeah, you would need just, more stone for the ramps right, uh, right, than you right. would the I, actual I, I pyramid. I just go back and, and see what the heck was going on back then. I would love to be p- placed in there just to see. Um, I mean, look, like I said, I was just trying to say that in a way. Like, I'm not trying to, like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, like, for me, when we started this podcast, I was so interested in, like, how did they do it kind of a thing. Like, how exactly, and I don't think we're ever going to exactly know how they did it, Um, even if we get a better idea. I mean, they could have just had a better understanding of angles and and, uh, physics and things like that with given sand and um, things of that nature. Like, there's some guy on YouTube that can move these, like, tons these huge stones the guys in like michigan i think i forget the video but he can you know he uses like a rock and can like balance and use these like 
rocks as fulcrums and turn these things, these massive, massive stones himself, just one dude. Um, yeah. So again, I think that we're under, we, sometimes we underestimate the ingenuity of some of these ancient people and cultures. And even though they had less, they might've been able to do more with the natural surroundings than we give them credit for. So. Well, the whole life was a different paradigm as well. So it's like, right. who knows how they're even taking in information and spitting it out. It's just, it was a completely different time back then. It's, it's an almost impossible for us to put ourselves back in that time to figure out things and look at things. And it's just, it is what it is really. Right. Um, so there is the external ramp theory, which we mentioned, which you would need more um, stone than the actual pyramid needed to be built to create this ramp. Then there's some people that said that they use some of the stone from the ramp to finish off the pyramid, things like that. Um, and then there is the internal ramp theory. The internal ramp theory was put forth by Jean-Pierre Houdin or Houdin. He's like a French uh, engineer, uh, and he spent a lot of time uh, in researching um, uh, 3D modeling technology. Uh, there are some holes in the theory, according to Bob uh, Breyer, who I mentioned earlier. He did some special with uh, Jean-Pierre, or he did a special on how the pyramids were built. I forget what channel it was. It wasn't, it might have been Discovery. I don't think it was. I forget what channel it was on, but it was a special on the different possibilities of how it was built and of specifically focusing on this internal ramp theory. Um, some interesting things came out of it. You know, they did like thermal scans of the inside and things like that and looked at the different chambers. And um, the conclusion I think was that it's possible, but not probable kind of a thing. So I think they still lean uh -huh. more towards the, what they were uh, looking at before. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Here's a picture of the Great Pyramid. It's awesome. Again, I think, I think, again, I'll go back, but I think some people look at that and they think, oh, that looks pretty bland. And that's why they point to the the Pyramid of Khafra because it's still got a little bit of that white limestone at the top. Kind of gives it like more of like a standout look and it looks taller from the distance. I don't think it's bland. I love that. Here is a little figurine of Khufu. And again, Khufu is the oldest son of Sneferu. Sneferu, again, we saw the progression of the building of the original pyramids. And again, it started with mastabas, which are, you know, these graves that they would build. And they, they were having trouble because um, they would find that the sand would blow away. Um, so they were looking for better ways to preserve these tombs and these bodies. And that's the speculation of why. Um, and then you have Zoser, he starts building up and you've got these leveled, the step pyramid, and then you have Sneferu come along and uh, trying to build on top of that. And then it just seemed like it just took off from there. Um, here's a close up angle, of the great pyramid. Again, if you're uh, listening on audio platform, check out our YouTube channel because we've got pictures. There's uh, the entrance there. You can see I'll get a little bit closer. You can see the, like the scale of it. There's a little, um, like a little stair handles on each side. If you can see at the very bottom of the front of that, do you see like little metal uh, handles? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like a scale, like Crazy. that's how big, yeah, you, know, you look at it like it looks like some small opening, but it's actually massive. No, you the last picture you could see people standing down there, so you right. can see. I love, so I love the stuff with the people. It's a nice scale. So here's a, a better, yeah, there's a better angle of it. You can see the, it almost looks like um, handles when you get out of a pool, you know, on each side. That's kind of the vibe. Mm -hmm. Here's a close-up of the... Uh, so what's interesting is even though it looks, you know, very precise from a distance, it looks, you know, some of the limestone blocks are pretty crude. As you can see, they don't really look that uniform. I mean, some of them are, but some of them are pretty rough. Yeah, but how much does that have to do with erosion? Yeah, that could be it. It could definitely be erosion. I mean, they're old. They're really old. Yeah. So, and also, I mean, and if, but they are, if they are different. Go ahead. I was going to say, if they are different stones, doesn't that 
even say more to their building technique that they can fit it all in there and make it yeah I mean, like that. yeah and but the other thing too is is like also i was going to point out too like even though there is erosion i mean it's in the desert there's really not that much rainfall i mean you could probably look up how much rainfall falls on the giza plateau and it's probably not much let's see Here is a uh, overhead diagram of all the structures surrounding the Great Pyramid. All the extra little, there's, you know, we've got the little smaller pyramids and some of the um, different structures around there. Are you looking that up, the rainfall? Yeah, it's, it says that throughout the year there's only 15 days of rainfall. That's nothing. And like I a mean, half an inch. It's probably, yeah, exactly. It's nothing. That's insane. And that'll come in handy when we start talking about the Sphinx and the erosion around the Sphinx, too. But here's a diagram key of the Great Pyramid. So as you can see there, C, which is at the very bottom, uh, is the unfinished subterranean chamber that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you have G, which is the uh, Grand Gallery. Uh, and you have F there, which is the uh, Queen's Chamber. Um, and uh, H, you have the King's Chamber there. And then L is the King's Relieving Chamber. So that's where you get, uh, so everything doesn't get crushed in. They, they built that relieving chamber to prevent uh, the pressure from the top part down from crushing, you know, the different chamber or the uh, King's Chamber. What's that curly little tunnel? I don't know what that is. I'm sure it's some That's passageway. Actually, I have. We're gonna. I'm gonna show some pictures in a minute of the interior uh, chambers and the passageways and stuff. Um, let's see here. Here's just another more intricate diagram of that. As you can see, you have the uh, king's chamber and relieving chamber, and then you have the entrance. So the entrance goes down, and then you've got uh, goes all the way down to the subterranean chamber, or you can go up into the grand gallery, and then into the king's chamber. Here's a uh, depiction or a illustration of the king's chamber, and again, those those the structures above the king's chamber are super important because that takes the pressure off. Um, you know, that's because those, those blocks are super heavy that could easily crush down if that wasn't there. Yeah. And how much stuff in there do you think is not mapped? Uh, well, there. okay, so there's there's been different, like, imaging things lately. There's some speculation that there's some other voids and uh, um, chambers that are haven't been tapped into yet. I don't know how... how big or if they you know are they just voids or is there something in there you know I don't know but there's there's been different scans and different teams um, that have done stuff like that I could mention that guy that that special that uh, the internal ram theory special that Jean-Pierre guy with a host by Bob uh, Breyer and they go into the whole um, image scanning scanning um, aspect of it and the different voids and stuff and also uh, I think recently they um, there's speculation that this structure somehow draws power out through the top too. I'm not a proponent of the power plant theory or that it was a power plant or something along those lines, but um, something about the pyramid structure and the way that the earth is and the way energy, you know, vibrates through that structure kind of a thing. And there's been studies of like, things in pyramids and stuff like that. I don't know. Actually, yeah, not, like too far, not, not too far from where I live um, outside of Chicago, there's a guy that built a, um, a house uh, called, the, it's called the Gold Pyramid. You can probably find this documentary on YouTube. It's called the Gold Pyramid. It's in um, 
Wadsworth, Illinois. It's no longer open to the public, but for these, this guy, he was like the concrete king in Chicago, and he spent a large sum of his fortune rebuilding a huge pyramid as his house. And there's like a massive Egyptian statue, like when you first drive in, I think it's like a hundred feet tall or something ridiculous. And then he covered his whole house and like gold, the pyramid that he built and gold plating and stuff. I mean, it's a crazy story. So I highly recommend everybody. I'll try and find the link and add it to the bottom of the video and the episode notes uh, after we're done with this. But yeah, that's a, it's a documentary, but it's super interesting. And uh, again, it's not that far from where I am. I've driven past there a few times to check it out, but there was a lot of overgrowth. It was hard to see back there. So, Mm -hmm. um, okay. So here we have the King's chamber, uh, and the pyramid of Khufu. Again, these are just some diagrams I wanted to pull up so people can get an idea. Uh, some are drawings some are like survey looking things um let's see here okay so here's some old i forget uh these brothers names these photos it's these guys that wrote this book um uh, i forget their names but they had these old pictures from that uh so this is the king's chamber in the pyramid of khufu these are just black and white photos here. Here you can see the king's chamber and the pyramid. You need special credentials to go in there? Uh, I mean, I don't know how, you, you know, a good pe- person to ask or a good people to be asked would probably be Russ and Kyle from Brothers of the Serpent. I know they were just in Egypt, but I know like all those people do trips. You know, you have Ben from Uncharted X. He does trips. You have... Uh, Annie XT does trips. You have all these people doing trips now to Egypt. So if anybody's interested, I'm sure you can look into that. But yeah, I mean, I think that you pay money to get into some of these places. Of course you you do. You know, you got to shell out a little bit of money. up, yeah. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, some people would say it's worth it. I mean, I don't know how much or whatever, but so here you have the King's Chamber here. Again, here's the king's chamber. You can see a little passageway down there. So here's the sar- sarcophagus in the king's chamber in the Pyramid of Khufu. You can see there's um, there's six people sitting sideways across it. Um, there's some people that say, oh, it's too large for a person, or it's too small for a sarcophagus, or, you know, there's arguments back and forth. Um, or they used high technology to carve it out and blah, 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 blah. Um, I think it's possible, like, I think whether or not, whether or not the pyramids were used as tombs or built for to, as tombs, whatever, um, you can't deny the ego of, of humans, especially pharaohs and rulers and kings, to say that it for sure wasn't, um, built by somebody as their like resting tomb would underestimate the ego of the human or of humans, you know, or the human mind. I mean, how many Uh people do you know? Like, you know, like, I don't know, just think about the people that have done things to become great. I mean, you look at the world now, everybody's trying to make their mark uh, in different ways, but even back then somebody having that much power and that much um, resources and stuff at their disposal. I mean, they literally, um, I don't know. I find it more plausible the more I look into things that it was a tomb. Now, whether there was an actual body rest, you know, if his, if it was Khufu's body actually put it there or not, I don't know, but it could have just been like a memorial to Khufu or something along those lines. It says it's 80 to 120 to take a tour. And I think you can get into the King's chamber. All right. Interesting. But it says 40, 4,500. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, never mind. I was going to say I thought it was 4,500 <laughs> people a year, but that seems low. So, again, there's, there's different theories. Some people think that, like, uh, what is it, Chris uh, Dunn has written books on the pyramids being uh, power plants, similar to, like, how Tesla's ta- power tower or, um, you know, the tower that he built to create free electricity 
Um, you know, you have all these different theories. Uh, there's some people that say, um, you know, that it's some sort of sound machine or device or, you know, things like that. There's all these different, like, weird theories. Or a chamber to meditate in. I like a lot of those theories. They're cool. So there is, that is something that I've talked to a few different people that say the acoustics in there are crazy. Like, there's some parts where when you talk, it's so loud from the echo that you can't even hear anything else. Um, so, yeah, if you were to chant or meditate, I could I could see it getting pretty weird. Yeah. Um you know, it just depends. Well, it's definitely based on raising our vibrations coming right. from Mr. Vibrations. There you go. Mr. Vibrations. <laughs> but again, there's a, feel it. there's a sarcophagus of Khufu. Um, and then obviously, look, the corner's been busted out. And uh, where's the top? You know, and then but the they must thing... feel pretty comfortable bringing people in there. Like, they must feel very confident with the with with the structure not collapsing if they're pay, taking people in there left oh no right. yeah no no it's super secure in terms okay. of that like compared to like the Benton pyramid or something yeah i mean i wouldn't be based on what i know i wouldn't be too concerned about it uh okay here's the uh diagram of the antechamber see the east wall there and the west wall north wall south wall so yeah these are just again diagrams i just wanted to put that out there so people have an idea how that's kind of laid out on the inside here's the vertical section the subterranean chamber or it's called the pit you can see there the diagram okay so here's a picture of the subterranean chamber pretty cramped yeah huh? this is a if, claustrophobic nightmare man I don't, I, don't, I don't know if this big boy's getting through there that's what yeah i went I, splunking in the in no. the mammoth caves i was gonna say in, remember in kentucky when, remember when we went to the up michigan on that one hogar trip and we went to yeah. the, those underground caves dude i didn't think i was getting through a couple of those well i went portions. to this thing where they actually measure you because there's a part called the keyhole and you have to like squeeze through this hole it's intense it's, but do you it, but the one that we went to there was no like guides or anything in the up like we just took no, a those chance. were those were cool too yeah I like we that. took a that chance we another. jumped down first of all this thing was the most mossy thing people were slipping cracking their bones on the you know the edges <laughs> of this thing you get down there and then it's literally like this tiny i don't even know i mean how far was that do you think the one in michigan it wasn't super long but it wasn't like short either no, it was, it was probably, you know, 100 yards or so. It was, I thought it was a lot longer. Than I don't know. I was a kid. It, 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 the distances are hard we to measure. That young. Legs we were, were shorter. That's we were, true. We were definitely I don't remember. We were the Delge at that yeah. point. <laughs> Those were during the, the fish tour days. Yeah. Um, so here's another uh, picture of the uh, subterranean chamber. So there you see this looks like you, you get a better view of like once they actually get through the tunnels there. I see this guy popping out the hole. <laughs> uh, there you go. So and then again, this is another picture of the subterranean chamber. It looks some parts look like it's decently carved out. And this looks like definitely looks pretty crumbly and unfinished clearing. That's where I get nervous. Yeah. Here's another uh, picture of the subterranean chamber. Uh, okay, so here we have, you can see like the well shaft. Again, these are, anybody that's listening, we're looking at diagrams of the interior part of the, the uh, Great Pyramid. And the diagrams, a uh, mixture of pictures and uh, surveys. Here you have a branch of the uh, Grand Gallery and the, the Great Pyramid. Uh, you can see there that walkway. Here is a diagram of the uh, Grand Gallery. Here you have the Queen's Chamber uh, and the Pyramid of Khufu. I 
again, here's another picture of the Queen's Chamber. Here is somebody carved 1872 above uh, this tunnel in the Queen's Chamber. Yeah, it's a uh, prehistoric graffiti. <laughs> Uh, and okay, so now that was the Great Pyramid. I just wanted to get through because there was just so many diagrams and pictures. But if you're interested, go back, pause it, check it out. The resources are there. I mean, a lot of that stuff was either pulled from uh, Adobe Stock or, um, uh, you know, Wikipedia or whatever. So that's cool. You can find it online. So here we get to the Pyramid of Khafre again. So I think when I see people talk about the Great Pyramid, you know, they point to Khafre because it still has the limestone cap or the Tura stones partially on top. Uh, and it also stands a little bit taller or appears to stand a little bit taller because it's on the bedrock or foundation. Um, so again, you know, the Pyramid of Khafre uh, was built in roughly 2585 BC. Here's a black and white picture of it. Um, I don't know. How did you perceive it before? Did you, did you know that the, the taller looking pyramid was not the great pyramid or what did you think about or did you not think? No, I always assumed that the great was the biggest. Well, it is bigger, but it's, it's an optical it, yeah, illusion. Yeah, it's an illusion. Yeah. But I always, I, I always just look at them with the, with the rigid, the rigid out side but it's it's interesting to think about it with a nice smooth that would be cool to see yeah there's reconstructions you know and people making videos of like what it would right. look like with the smooth limestone or the polished limestone um and like a casing stone on top here you have the interior diagram of the pyramid of kafra okay i'm not gonna spend too much time uh, so we get to the Great Sphinx of Giza, um, built roughly from 2558 to 2532 BC during the reign of Khafre, question mark. So this is the one that most people get hung up on. Is the Sphinx older? Um, is it dated to the same, you know, age as Khafre? Um, you know, I'll show you, you know, why. I could go either way on it, pretty much. Yeah, but well, does isn't it proven that it was built upon, built upon? We'll get to it, but yeah, you can see around the base there. Okay, so the Sphinx Temple, which is not far from the Sphinx, um, they used the stone that was carved away. You can see around the base of the Sphinx. That stone was used to then build the temple of the Sphinx Temple, and you can see the water erosion around the base of the Sphinx. That's the point of contention for most people that would say it's older, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. I want to go through some of these depictions throughout history, so you can see the artist renditions through the years and how they progress. Uh, here you can see kind of like a, a, doesn't really look like the Sphinx, but they're trying to depict the Sphinx with a couple of pyramids behind them. Then we progress to a little bit of better, uh, a little bit better of a illustration, and but more of a pointy style pyramidal structure, kind of like a weird sphinx, like a sphinx slash cyclops hybrid behind it. Yeah, it's weird to see what people's perceptions of things are, even though they're like looking at it or like were those artist renditions based on like listening to people talk about them? You know, I don't know. Yeah, um, or was this thing buried at the time? Look at this one. So yeah, this one's not bad. You can see the Sphinx uh, in front of the Pyramid of Khafre. Um, That's crazy. It did have more a, of a human face. Yeah, here you get a little bit more closer towards what this, you know, start seeing the progression. Looks a little bit more Sphinxy like. That one looks pretty good, I think, from the side. And the Sphinx is buried, obviously, a bunch of times throughout history. And this is post nose chop. <laughs> and we'll talk about that too. The whole um, urban legend that Napoleon soldiers shot the nose off. And while that most likely happened, so like 1799, you get Napoleon rolling up um, uh, 
and he brought a lot of scientists. So that's basically where you get a lot of the information that we have and like how the Rosetta stone eventually became decoded and all that was because of Napoleon uh, and bringing scientists and people to go check out all this stuff. Because before that it was all just like mystical in nature. It wasn't really investigated deeply, but he brought a lot of thinkers and scientists and stuff and they were able to kind of look through some of the stuff and that's where you get kind of more modern day uh archaeology and egyptology from that whole excursion so Uh uh-huh um and then i think there was a there was a fight between britain and france and i think that's how britain got control of the rosetta stone and a lot of the stuff there was a battle over that if i'm not mistaken okay here you get kind of just some more depictions of the sphinx here you have this is pretty good um it's napoleon on a horse facing the sphinx yeah it's a painting that looks real realistic it's an actual picture i believe I don't know about that. Yeah. No. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's a picture. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think out there? Is that a picture? I don't know. Those people look pretty realistic. I... <laughs> That's for sure real. Yeah. That's real. Yeah, this is real too. Maybe we're, all, was, we're looking at black know. and white photos of the Sphinx. Um, that's real. But You've got like some sort guy's of guys got a there's like there's a photographer right there. So they call him Hansel Haddams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, you had to hold the shutter down for three minutes just to get a regular picture. It's insane. Didn't people used to get sick too? Weren't there like chemicals that they used for like the flash that like made people sick from early photography, if I'm not mistaken? I don't know about that, but every time that you use the flash, you only get to use one ball. You had to use one bulb per flash because it would blast the bulb. I, th- I took like a photography class in college and I could have swore there was something about like the development of the photo. That Yeah, that might, yeah, that might be true. That you had to soak it in a certain chemical, but the other thing was... I always wondered why everybody back in the day they never would smile, and the the reason is because the it shutter seven when the years camera yeah. would have, it was such a long shutter that it was like it was impossible to hold the smile for that long. Um. Okay. So we get to the dream steel. So it's either steel or Stella. Steel comes from the Greek origin of it. Stella is the Latin. Um, and these are just it looks like a tombstone kind of a thing. Um, if you've ever seen the Sphinx, there's the, the dream steel, which is in between the paws. Uh, the Sphinx steel is known as the dream steel because uh, it tells the story of Prince Tutmos IV, who fell asleep near the great Sphinx of Giza during a hunting trip and dreamt that the Sphinx promised him the throne of Egypt in return for Tutmos, or Tutmosis, there's different ways to pronounce it, clearing the sand away from it. Uh, he did what he was instructed to do, in his dream and cleared the sand away from the Sphinx and became Pharaoh Tutmos the fourth. Uh, the steel or Stella, uh, is actually a reused door lintel, um, from the entry to the mortuary temple of Kafra. According to researchers, the pivot sockets on the back of the steel are a match for those at the threshold of the mortuary temple. Uh, Dr. Hutan Ashfarian, Ashfarian, I don't know how to pronounce that guy's last name, uh, who is a surgeon at Imperial College London, hypothesized that the early and untimely deaths of Tutmos IV and other 18th dynasty pharaohs, including Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, uh, were likely a result of familial temporal epilepsy. This condition can cause dreamlike states, auras, synthesia, and other symptoms. Uh, this could explain the mystical nature of these pharaonic experiences. So basically what this doctor is saying is that this lineage from Tutmos IV to Akhenaten to Tutankhamun, they had these mystical natures about them because they had familial temporal epilepsy, which causes, you know, dreamlike states, auras, mm-hmm. synthesia, you know, and 
because we talk so much about the mind and philosophy of the mind and psychedelics and things like that, um, these altered states of consciousness wouldn't rule out some sort of mystical nature to it. It would just be a physical explanation of what's happening to, you know, these people. So while that might be the mechanism, there could be still something more mystical behind that. Um, and maybe that's what gave them, um, these powers or these, uh, these power to rule or these, you know, um, these, uh, legacies. Yeah. But I just thought that that was an interesting theory or take on that. It absolutely is. Because we know, uh, King Tut had a lot of medical issues. As I mentioned earlier too, his skull might've been bashed in by his vizier at some point. Um, Akhenaten, they think had some sort of, uh, stuff going on physically. And he definitely had a little bit of a different appearance than some of the other pharaohs, um, in terms of like his, like body structure. I don't even know, like, uh, and again, I don't know what Tutmos the fourth looked like, but again, I know Akhenaten and Tutankhamun had probably some health issues. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can see the dream steel there. It's peeking up uh, above the paws. I don't know. Can you see that in the middle? Yeah. It looks like a tombstone kind of. Uh-huh. Yeah, there you go. That's what that is. Um, here's a close-up of it. Is. There you go. And here is a sketch or like a tracing of what's on the dream steel. If anybody's interested, I didn't want to read. There's like a, I was going to thought about reading it, but it's pretty long. So, but anybody's interested, you can read what's on the dream steel. It just kind of basically describes what I was talking about. The like story of like Tutmos and uh, all that. Here is a side view of the Sphinx. So the Sphinx is carved, um, carved away. You can, you know, there's different levels of shoal, uh, which is a type of stone that's, you know, it's carved away from. It's been restored a bunch of times. Um, obviously the head, the proportions don't really look you know, there's a lot of speculation. So there's people that speculate, you know, like a Graham Hancock will speculate that it was a, uh, a lion's head that faced the Leo constellation, you know, 1050 BC, which was part of that Orion. Um, yeah. Orion alignment uh, theory that he and Babal had. back real deep. And then you have uh, some people that said it was Anubis, which Anubis might actually make sense if there was a jackal's head. Um uh, on there and actually anybody that likes Anubis go check out our merch store I have an Anubis shirt that I created it's pretty sweet anyways um, the head does definitely doesn't look in proportion with the rest of the body um, so again there's people that think it's been like recarved or refigured uh, let's see here so here we get into the erosion aspect of it. So I highlighted there in the circle, um, is it water, water erosion, wind erosion, or something else? So there's a number of different theories. Um, one of the theories, obviously, that's uh, been around for a long time was uh, um, Dr. Robert Schock, who is a geologist. I think he teaches at Boston university or boston college i forget but uh i mean he's got a good education i think he went to like yale and stuff so he's not just some you know random geologist that came up with this but uh he his theory is that it would have had to have been a lot longer ago than what did i say it was built 25 that are in the ru ruling of copper yeah. roughly 2500 bc or 2550 so he's saying that it's a lot older based on this uh water erosion because there wouldn't have been that amount of water erosion that's happened roughly during that time period. Um, there's some people that say that the Nile could flood or um, there's different things. I think that there's even some mainstream geologists that have speculated that there could be these salt deposits that are embedded into the stone. And then once a little bit of moisture or dew gets stuck in the, the uh, sand in some of those deposits, it, 
pushes away the rock, as you can see, uh, creates that. Um, so the one that I, th I find weird is the wind uh, erosion, um, which would be that, uh, you know, you look at like the sides of the canyons and like Utah and, uh, you know, different places in the, the American West and Southwest. And you see like these amazing um, geological structures that are caused by wind. I just don't think that that amount of time that that could have caused, that could have been caused by wind. I just don't think it's wind. So I think it's probably water erosion, but I don't know um, enough about geology to say if it's from the salt deposits, if it's from, um, you know, water runoff, the Nile being diverged or the Nile flooding or, um, you know, I know you could go to John Anthony West and he speculated it could even be as old as 30,000 years ago. Like maybe it looked a little bit of different back then, or it's been recarved since then or whatever. But, uh, that, but you know, then you would have to say, well, how old is the Sphinx temple then too? Because that's where those blocks came from was around there. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. I think it's possibly older. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what do you hmm. think? Uh, I like the I like the Graham Hancock theory, but that takes it back a, a long, long time. So yeah, that'd be ten thousand five hundred BC. So I mean, you have to think. Uh, you have to think. So ten thousand five hundred BC. You have to think. You're roughly around the time of Gobekli Tepe. Maybe a little. You're a little bit after Gobekli Tepe. You're a thousand years I also, after you're a thousand years after Gobekli Tepe. Do you think that you know, like it just that advanced? Well, I'm just saying, like, you could, okay, so you either believe that it was something else previously, right? Like, okay, it could have been a different animal or this or that. But if that's the case, then what it what was it? Because that means everything. If it was a different animal, was it something that was connected to ancient Egypt? Was it um you know I, like I said, I, th I think the Anubis thing would make sense to me, um, especially given the nature of, you know, these are mortuary or um, uh, these are tombs. You know, the Anubis is associated with death. I think, you know, um, jackals are known to go around and eating like partially dead bodies and things like freshly dead bodies, and things like that. So. Yeah, um, that would fit in with like the mythology of ancient Egypt, and I don't think there was the mythology of ancient Egypt around at the same time as Gobekli Tepe, um, based on what I've researched and looked at. So I don't know. What do you think? I think, uh, I I think it's definitely been what it was water erosion. That's one thing that I definitely think. But as far as the face, I don't know. It just doesn't look proportionate, and like the rest of their stuff. So, if you look at the rest of the statues in ancient Egypt, aside from when we've talked about this on past episodes, the the noses being chiseled off or defaced, um, you know, there's different speculation about that. Do they did were those other cultures coming in that have conquered, you know, and taking the life force away from the statue, um, you know, people conquering and that kind of a thing, and people associated uh breathing with the life force and that's why they chopped off the noses that kind of a thing uh -huh. um you know so like i don't know there's different thoughts in terms of that but could that have happened to the sphinx too that's why I, that's why i just brought that up could there have been some sort of conquering at some point which they would have you know defaced the nose to take the life force away from the sphinx i don't know yeah but it's another mystery so yeah, I definitely think it's possible that it's older, but it could have been something else before. Um, but at the same time, let's just say it is 2500 or 2550 BC. Um, that doesn't, again, that's not going to make me feel any less or anything about ancient Egypt. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I think there's some people yeah. that need these things to be true to make it interesting or to make it uh, mystical in nature or whatever. I don't need that to be the case. I find 
I find their fascination with death and the way that they mummified bodies, the way that they took parts of the brain out, the way that they understood consciousness, the ba, the ka, use of entheogenic plants like blue lotus, um, cannabis, other psychoactive compounds. I find all that stuff far more interesting than what year things were built or not built and things like that. So Yeah, that's, that's true. But again, it's it's I, I find it interesting, so I still research these things. I'm just saying, like, if this was built when the mainstream archaeologists say they were built, then um, I don't know. I don't have a problem well, with it. Well, the great debate, that's the bottom line, is it'll be debated for a long time. Well, I mean, and the other thing is, um, in terms of, like, again, I just don't think it's wind erosion. I think it's probably water erosion. It could have, have been from some sort of runoff or whatever. Like I said, there's that. There's the guy that thinks that there were, like, salt deposits or some sort of, you know, but I think... Uh, Robert Schock didn't, wasn't a fan of that idea. I don't know why. Again, it's hard to tell when you start writing books and have you stake your reputations based on believing this or believing that, um, you tend to back your own ideas up harder and more than others. You know what I'm saying? Like you become less open-minded, not because you don't want to be wrong. It's part of the human ego True. to do those yeah. things. So. Um, I'm not saying one way is right or the other. I'm just, again, presenting these ideas and letting people decide for themselves. Again, I think it's water erosion. I'm not saying that the Sphinx is older, but I do think that that is water erosion. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that. So if anybody has any other theories or ideas, leave a comment or whatever. I'll I'll take a look at it. Uh, But, yeah, that's just kind of what I've looked into, the different geologists have to say, and... um, yeah, I know, you know, like I said, there's people that do videos on this that are completely sold on things. You know, you have the guy Ben from Uncharted X, or you have Annie XT, you know, you have all these different people making videos. Um, and they go into way more depth about this kind of stuff uh, than we will. So that's really, again, I'm more into the mindset and the mind and philosophy of mind and how, you know, they perceive these things. But I just thought we would go over all this stuff based on what we used to think and versus now, because there are some things that we're going to dispel, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes. So, All right. So we get to some of the alternative theories. Um, so I actually took this slide from, if, if anybody likes these kinds of episodes, we did a slideshow episode for the seven wonders of the ancient world where we had a ton of information. I think that's one of our better older episodes. So if you're interested, go check that out. It's uh I don't know what number episode it is, but it's the seven wonders of the ancient world. Anyways, I took this slide from that where we talked about alternative theories. Um, and again, I mentioned there's all these different researchers now, but there's a growing number of researchers and ac- academics that suggest the great pyramid and the Sphinx are possibly older than suggested, uh, and had unknown purpose. Um, some of these alternative re- researchers are John Anthony West, RIP, Robert Bavall, Graham Hancock, Dr. Robert Schock, Chris Dunn, Randall Carlson, Laird Scranton, and others. We have had Randall Carlson on a couple times. We've had Laird Scranton on five or six times now. Um, And uh, I'd like to have Hancock on at some point. Uh, You know, I've reached out to Schock. No response on that. So, you know, can only do so much here. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to pick some of these people's brains and, uh, you know, see what's what but um some of these theories correlate to the younger dryas impact theory uh which was a cataclysmic a cataclysmic event roughly 12,800 years ago involving an asteroid or a comet graham hancock randall carlson george howard are proponents of this hypothesis and they've done a great job of making the public aware of it um dr shock and anthony perrott have done research regarding plasma discharge in ancient times that correlates to uh the ancient petroglyphs and symbolism. Um, yeah, Robert Schock wrote a book on that. I forget the name of it, but uh, Dr. Anthony Perrault is like a plasma physicist from Los Alamos, and um, his research is pretty interesting. Actually, I did. we did an episode, um, I think it was Easter Island Part 2, uh, where we talk a lot about his, the correlation between his work and petroglyphs and stuff like that. So if you're interested, go check that out. 
Uh, but the discharges would have been cataclysmic and they would have pushed civilization to the brink, which shock calls a solar induced dark age or Siddha. Uh, it also may explain why some of the ancient gods depicted with animal heads uh, and the design shape of some of the petroglyphs. Um, usually zoomorphism or therian, uh, therianthropy uh, are used to describe these ancient ha animal headed gods. Um, Baval and Hancock made connections between the alignments of Orion's belt and the three pyramids of Giza, dating to roughly again to 10,500 BC. The uh, Orion constellation was associated with Osiris and the rebirth of the in the afterlife. Um, John Anthony West speculated the water erosion around the base of the Sphinx and the Egyptian King's List together might date to the site to roughly 30,000 BC. So, you know, when you hear Zeptepi, which means in, in um, each, you know, Egyptian means the first time. So there's speculation. What does that mean? Does that mean, you know, the pre-civilization leading up to um, what we know as ancient Egypt or the, uh, the old kingdoms and stuff like that? I, again, I would recommend the Great Courses Lecture by Bob Breyer on Audible because he goes through like prehistoric times because there was you know, there was people living in the Nile Delta in that area from like tens of thousands of years ago, way even before civilization. So again, I, I suggest looking into those things before you just jump to conclusions on what's what. Um, uh, where were we? Okay. John Anthony wants to speculate. Oh yeah. Um, 30,000 BC. The speculation was based on geologist Robert Schock's dating of the Sphinx based on the vertical water erosion evidence. Again, we just went over that. Definitely looks like water erosion, but how or when that happened, uh, you know, I think that's still open for debate. Uh, other theories suggest it was a power plant. People suggest it was Noah's Ark or the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant or some sort of lost or ancient technology. I, th those last ones I'm not a fan of. I'll, you know, if somebody's got something interesting on that, I'll take a look. But I like the power plant one. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Like the whole Tesla um you know, tower at, uh, what's it called? The Tesla's tower that he built that was shut down by JP Morgan. Um, but yeah, again, I don't, does that mean that that's what that is? No, not necessarily. It just means that, um, you know, people are throwing ideas out there. So, right. I mean, look, if there wasn't a sar sarcophagus in there or there wasn't, um, association with death or tombs you know that progression we said we went all the way back to Zoser and then we went to Sneferu and the progression of Sneferu from Mastaba to Pyramid if you don't see that progression I'd be a lot I'd be open to a lot more but you do see natural progression um, mm -hmm. yeah Wardenclyffe thank you ancient history criticisms um, good call uh, but yeah, I, I see, you know, I'm all about, you know, looking for different ideas and, um, you know, f outside the box theories and things like that to explain things that are unexplainable or that we just don't have a ton of knowledge on. But at the same time, I'm not just going to go along with stuff just to go along with stuff. Like I said, I think you have to look at things from all sides. You have to look at the mainstream. You have to look at the alternative. And then once you have all the knowledge on, you know, you've read all the other people's takes on things, then you can deduct your own reasoning and logic from there. So, I mean, that's just my way of looking at these things. I mean, everybody. Yeah, that's a good approach. That's for sure. Welcome to do what they want. You know, if you want to, if this is just fun to you, or you just want to speculate or something, that's fine. I mean, I'm personally after truth or if there is some sort of objective truth, I don't know if there is, but if there is, that's what I'm after. So, mm hmm here we get to the unfinished Aswan obelisk. Um, Hatshepsut ordered it to be constructed in 1508, and it was constructed between 1508 and uh, 1458 BC. Um, so everybody knows, too, all the Egyptian goddesses and some of the queens and everything, their names always end with a T, you know, like Bastet, uh, uh, even uh, so Isis people would point to that being as the exception, but actually Isis in Egypt is East like I S T or something. And I think Isis is actually Greek. Um, so that's the Greek, um, uh, way to say that. So yeah, all the, you know, and actually I wanted to get an all to the, into the whole 
uh, Egyptian God thing, but I think we're going to do a separate episode on that entirely and just go through all the Egyptian gods and goddesses and the origins of that and all of the myths and everything like that. So, All right. Here's another picture of the unfinished obelisk. So this thing was cracked sometime during um, the middle, and it kind of reminds me of, if you remember when we did the Easter Island episodes, how the one Moai is still stuck in the... Raru Raraku quarry, the volcanic tough quarry, you know, it's still stuck in the side of that that volcanic mountain. This kind of yeah. reminds me of that a little bit. It's still stuck there. It's because that the one on Easter Island was going to be the one of the largest moai too, and it's just so massive. It's just stuck there in the quarry still. Same thing with this. I think it was just too large and it snapped. Damn. You can see there the size of it. It's huge. Okay, and this is something I really wanted to get to because this is one of the first episodes we did. I brought this up, and I was like a believer, like, oh, my God, look at what they're showing. You know, they don't want you to see this, you know, Temple of Seti. They don't, they, they don't want you to, you know, they cover it up or tell you not to look or whatever, but this is completely BS. So in the Temple of Seti uh, at Abydos, Abydos, you have these glyphs, and some people call them like the James Bond car or the helicopter or the spaceship or UFO or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. This is just a case of, this is actually the perfect example of pareidolia. So if anybody doesn't know what pareidolia is, it's our mind puts these patterns together. So if you look up at the clouds, it's like a similar idea of like looking up at the clouds and seeing a dog or a bird or something like yeah. that, and a face and the, you know, or seeing faces and things and things like that. That's pareidolia. Um, so, and if people don't know what I'm talking about, this has been on tons of shows. And I'm not even going to mention the names, obviously of the shows that we've kind of disparaged over the years, but uh, yeah, in terms of um, this glyph. So what what's happening here, that's not a James Bond car or a UFO. It's not a, a Apache helicopter. That's not what's going on here. Um, so what's happening is this is a product of stone being recarved and reused. The original carving was scribed during the reign of Seti the first, and it translates to he who repulses the nine enemies of Egypt. Uh, the carving was then filled in with plaster and recarved during the time or the reign of Ramses the second, which read he who protects Egypt and overthrows the foreign countries. Over the years, the plaster eroded away and left both inscriptions partially visible, creating the imagery that invokes pareidolia. Again, it's based on the, um, we're basing this on our ideas and visual perceptions of modern technology. So it just happens to look like that. Um, I will say that, um, you know, people that want to believe that, I mean, believe what you want, but that's just the truth of it. But in, in reality, um, it's just, you know, you can get things that, you know, overlap sometimes. And I mean, I've seen them separated and stuff and it's clearly not that. So, I mean, there's mm. some shows that, you know, like an ancient aliens or some shows that run with that kind of a thing and be like, look, they're, you know, this is what's going on. And, you know, that's just not the case. But, uh, this was one of the ones I wanted to point to because again, when we started this podcast, like over four years ago, you know, we would have been, I was not necessarily fully on board with it, but I'm like, this is weird. Why is this there? Uh, yeah. but then, but then you do research. I mean, it doesn't look in this day and age, there's no reason to not know something. We have Google. When you Google something, make sure you look at like three or four different sources. Once you've looked at like all the sources or a few different people's takes, I think you have a better knowledge of what's going on and you can make educated, you know, decisions on what's happening here. And I don't think enough people do that. Again, if it's fun and you want to speculate, have fun and speculate, but then don't get in fight with fights with people online. If you're just speculating, you know what I'm saying? I think uh-huh. that that's where I get aggravated when I see people. It's like, it takes five to 10 minutes to research this. Why are you arguing with people online? So, <sighs> But yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Here's another thing. Um, So the Edfu Temple Complex, some people might have used this as my background for the green screen for our episodes sometimes, but um, this temple was built during the uh, uh, Ptolemaic Kingdom between 237 BC and 57 BC. And 
people say that the stairs are melted. Um, and if you look, they kind of do look like they're melted. But are they really melted? And what, what you know, I think when some people point to this, it's like there's this idea that there was some special potion um, that was like corrode stone, and that's how they were able to do this or that. Or the, I'm not opposed to that, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but another explanation would be if you even if you look at the Great Wall of China and the the path that most people step on, it, yeah. it erodes away. It slowly erodes away. If enough people walk on something, it slowly erodes away. Now you could say also there maybe it's water erosion too, but it's just so many people walking over this. And even though it's granite or hard stone or whatever, it can still wear away over time. I mean, it's just Absolutely. it's possible. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this is the, this is the, there's a couple of these. I mean, there's a few examples, but this is one of the examples. Another example would be the Temple of Hathor. Uh, this was built during the Ptolemaic period at the time of Ptolemy uh, in July uh, 54 BC. Same thing. You can kind of see the wearing away of the stairs. Um, similar uh, kind of a walkway. Um, but look, this is a very narrow walkway and there's only so many places to step. So if enough people over time are walking in and out of there to pay homage or whatever the case may be, just to see it, to visit it, to, uh, you know, who knows, maybe do, uh, uh, rituals or whatever. I mean, it would just slowly wear away. Plus you have to think too, all these people have probably sand in their shoes or sandals or whatever. I mean, sand will wear away anything if you have enough of it and it's applying enough pressure. So, Yeah, I mean, that, that melting is a little bit of a stretch. So, yeah, there's some people that say it's, again, it was some sort of concoction. Other people say it was flooded and there's some sort of water erosion. Other people say um, that it was, you know, like this, some super hot thing happened. I don't know. I just, it's one of the, it's, I just wanted to point those out, though, because there are people that, you know, that is one of the things that people say what's going on here. Uh-huh. Okay. So now we get to just some other structures. This is the Karnak Temple Complex. Uh, Karnak construction at the complex began during the reign of um, Senusret, uh the first, um, and in the Middle Kingdom, roughly 2000 to 1700 B.C., and it continued into the Ptolemaic period between 305 and 30 BC. Most of the extant buildings date uh, from the New Kingdom. So here we get a different angle. Here's nighttime. I think that the stars are fake. I don't know. I'd have to. Yeah. That looks like that's been photoshopped in after. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe that was super long exposure, but I don't I mean you would know. No, that's, that's fake. It's not hard to do in today's world. Uh, Karnak Temple Complex. So you can see this is a picture of the uh, exterior. And here we have the statues of the ram-headed sphinxes outside of the Karnak Temple at Luxor. Luxor, excuse me. Here we have the Temple of Edfu. Um, the temple was built in the Ptolemaic Kingdom between 237 B.C. and 57 B.C. And uh, this is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, uh, the 15th century B.C. That's kind of a cool shot, that aerial shot of that, like, you know. That's, oh, like that's a super, phenomenal. Yeah, super interesting cut out area must be from a helicopter it's from the helicopter from the temple of seti uh <laughs> cliff <laughs> james bond <laughs> yeah car helicopter uh the lux the luxor temple entrance uh the pylon of ramses II. that's uh 1279 to 1213 bc and you whenever you see the entrance like that where it's like one um uh kind of like a trapezoid on each side it's they're called pylons it's usually the entrance to some sort of temple or something so mm -hmm. but uh yeah i mean that's uh that's all we got for the slideshow but um that's a lot of good imagery that's all from uh adobe some of it's from adobe some of it's from wikipedia anything that's you know 
doesn't have a license on it or I you know I, I can get it from Adobe stock that's usually what we use um, sometimes we'll use images from people like our guests if they have you know like somebody like Randall Carlson will have a ton of his own stuff or whatever you mm-hmm. know but, uh, it just depends but uh, yeah I don't know like I said I just wanted to go through what we've discussed about ancient Egypt we'll do more um, in the future in ancient Egypt like I said I want to get more into the their understanding of the mind and the brain and yeah. uh, consciousness and uh, we're gonna do so we've covered a lot so far on the uh, mysteries and metaphysics I think we still have to get to what have we done we've done a lot of the ancient mystery stuff we've done consciousness esoteric and occult we've done gods and goddesses and creator we've done megalithic structures this was the last megalithic structure one we're doing with the slideshow uh we did metaphysics and the nature of reality okay so we still have to do near-death experiences and death psychedelics uh philosophy and space time in the universe and paranormal slash ufo stuff so yeah i like that near-death experience yeah it'll be a good time um but uh yeah i just uh it was this was a good one to get back in the swing of things um again if anybody has any guest um suggestions shoot us an email and i'll definitely at least entertain the idea um i mean if you listen to the show you know what kind of guests we have on anyway so um but yeah if anything that has to do with ancient stuff or civilizations philosophy psychedelics consciousness you know things like that obviously we tend to have you know, one foot in woo, one foot in reality. Um, yeah. Trying try to figure out what's what. But, I mean, like I said, I mean, we've had all sorts of people on over the years, so it just depends. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Also, Maurice has a new CD out uh, with his band Dogo. Um, yes, yes. We're going to do an episode on that where we discuss uh, music. We'll talk about music in general, but also his band specifically and uh, all that kind of stuff. I don't know when we'll do that. Maybe sometime next week. Um, but if you're interested, I'm going to add a link after we're done with this episode and you can check out his tracks. Uh, it's good stuff. If you like, um, jam rock kind of stuff, it's, uh, it's right up your alley. Um, yeah, yeah. we got a, we had a tune already out and another song coming out tomorrow at 1 PM. So if you can find it on, uh, Spotify under Dogo D O E G O E. And uh, it'll be on, we got a YouTube channel. Michael put some links, but go on Spotify if you want. And also while you're, while you're on Spotify, check out our uh, our podcast listing on there too. If you're going to travel on a plane or something and you don't have uh, an internet connection, you can download some of our episodes and uh, access them when you're, in, uh, when you're not on the internet. And uh, also too, uh, for Patreon, so all the Patreon stuff that's been up, we usually have, there's a, a YouTube link where you can watch it. Um, since we're getting rid of SoundCloud and we've switched to Anchor, uh, I'm just going to upload the audio directly to our, our Patreon so that it'll just be audio files on there too. So if you see a bunch of new episodes, it's just me um, re-updating the, uh, the audio stuff so there's both audio and video options because... Uh, like I said, we're not going to be on uh, SoundCloud anymore. But, um, yeah, looking forward to checking out Maurice's stuff. And eventually what we want to do, too, and we've talked about this before, is do some jam stuff where him and I jam on our Patreon maybe. Um, yeah, grab some other musicians and, and, and get some stuff going. We'll see yeah. if it's even possible, but it's a good I idea. Think po- I think we can do it through this technology, actually. I'm pretty sure we can. All right. I've looked into it a little bit. I mean, all you have to do is plug into your interface, too. I mean, you yeah. should have two inputs, I'm pretty sure, don't you? I have four, but yeah. I'm just worried about the latency issue. But, again, we'll test it out and see what happens. Yeah. If anything, um, we can play a couple of things individually and just talk about the ideas behind them and that kind of thing. It's all, all right. about human consciousness and raising our vibrations. I think music's one of the best tools to raise that vibration. Everybody knows how a song can make them happy or sad or pump them up when they're working out. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll have lots of good stuff coming up here. 
And again, I'll just throw stuff out here again. If you, we switch to Anchor as our host, so if you are listening on SoundCloud, go check out our Anchor um, page or go to uh, the Anchor app. We're on Spotify, Apple. We're on most of the, the podcast platforms. In fact, if somebody listens to us and we're not on one of the apps and you want us to get on there, just let me know and I'll try and manually upload it to the app so we should be on everything. Um, and before we get out of here, everybody head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash podcast for just $2 a month. You'll get exclusive guest episodes and segments. Again, I have one with Randall Carlson for most our most recent episode with Randall. Uh, where he goes through uh, the cosmic numbers and sacred geometry, which is uh, always a good good time. And we actually did one with him last year where he did a sacred, sacred geometry lesson, which was great. Uh, and if you like all the ancient mystery stuff, we've got a ton of stuff on there with Laird Scranton, uh, Dr. Gregory Little. I mean, just the list goes on. If we've had a guest on our show, there's a good chance that we've done some Patreons with him. So go check that out. Uh, we are on Discord too. If you want to chat with us, come jump on Discord. Here's a, a couple, some images of some of our merch uh, designs on our uh, our uh, merch store. So if you you haven't already, um, go check it out. I mean, T Public, uh, our T Public merch store. Um, get yourself a Let Maury Speak T-shirt. This guy doesn't speak <laughs> often, but when he does, uh, and you actually, my, the the, the one that I think or my favorite two are the Minuscape Portal one, which is the Portara at Nexos from Greece that I recreated, and the We Are Living Breathing Magic uh, shirt with Anubis holding the uh, Minuscape logo. Uh, those are probably my favorite two, but uh, again, go check those out. Uh, Injuresweb.org is live. Go sign up on your account, come chat with us, speculate, hypothesize, theorize. It's a social media platform we created, Connect Open Minds. We are trying to work on getting that in the App Store. And, uh, again, we were on busy with a hiatus. We're also working on our documentary and stuff. So there's just a lot of stuff going on um, that we're just trying to uh, figure out. As on top of me having a, my little guy here that's going to be uh, four months or four months old here. So, uh, And one more thing. If you are interested in winning this Mind Escape T-shirt, we have larges and mediums left. So if you wear a large or medium and you want to win this T-shirt, all you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts, I'll leave us a five-star review. Actually, let's extend this. Uh, if you want to win the shirt, you can either leave us an Apple uh, five-star review, Apple Podcasts five-star review, or a Spotify because now Spotify has a rating system. So we even use uh, Apple or Spotify five-star review, take a screenshot of it, and uh, send it to mindescapepodcast at gmail.com, and that will enter you to win. I will pick a winner at the end of the month of March. And uh, Yeah, head over, to, head over to Spotify and at least just follow us. And uh, while you're at it, you can follow Dogo. <laughs> there you go. D O E G O E. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's great stuff. Uh, I mean, I grew up playing music with Maurice. He's a uh, he's a really good songwriter. Um, Thanks, my man. Appreciate his guitar it. skills. Leave a little to be desired, but you know, no, I'm joking. No, <laughs> he's, good no, thing he's, I don't play the leads on these tracks. <laughs> no, he's good. He's good. I'm just busting chops here. No, he was always more of the songwriter singer, and I was always more of the guitar player when we used to play. But uh, you know. I'm I'm excited. I might be moving back to Michigan sometime in the future. Maybe we can get something going there too. For um, sure. And it might be nice to do a podcast in one location as well. So Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we should rebuild your fort and do it in the fort. <laughs> yeah, I wish we had that thing still going on. We might have to dig our own tunnel underneath the earth. And more like the, tra- in, like the tunnels and the the Sphinx. And more in high school, Maurice used to have this huge uh, fort, which actually was on stilts, and it was like elevated above his garage, in his backyard. It mm-hmm. was definitely like a building. Four by four it was definitely a building violation. It was against the code. Oh yeah, it was sure. like it was like a foot away from the the, the electrical line. But it had real like siding. <laughs> it had like a real door. I mean, it was like a real thing we used to go up there and party and stuff you could you know get away with play cards that. write music yeah chit chat talk about the same stuff we're still talking about today what happened to that thing by the way did did they cut it down the city or something yeah the guy who oh, it was my friend's uncle who actually like bought all the materials and everything he cut it down because i left my house i actually ended up buying my mom's house like probably 10 15 years after i moved out and uh 
I wish it was still there, but when I moved out, she wanted it out of the backyard and he came in with a little flat bed and chopped her down and I don't know where it went. No, that was that was back was a in good the day time. That when you're a freshman in high school and you've got nowhere else to go, that's that's a safe haven for sure. Yeah. Arte. Yep. Um but yeah, so uh lots to look forward to and um yeah, if anybody has any guests or topic suggestions, again, just send us an email. And uh, we appreciate everybody and any new um, – I'll go through and see, you know, I'll mention next time too any of the new Patreon supporters too. I'll give you guys a shout-out. Um, and uh, I think that's it, you know. The world's in chaos right now, but everybody stay safe out there, and we love everybody. And let's just all try and spread a little – love and peace and uh, we need smarter people in the world so spread knowledge you know let's let's get more people out there uh looking at all sides of things so we know what's what and not just one angle or one take and then running with it like learn you know look into things yeah. look into multiple different sources you know vet your sources so well 